Hi, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'm so happy that you've joined us for what I hope will be a fun and intriguing discussion. I'd like you to introduce you to our panelists. We have Andy Kroll, who has been covering the rise of Christian nationalism, Josh Kaplan, who wrote about the militia movement after January 6th, and A.C. Thompson, who recently published a piece about Telegram and domestic extremism. In our democracy and election coverage here at ProPublica, we've been focusing on groups that think democracy needs a reset. They each have their own lane, their own agendas, their own funding, sometimes tens of millions of it, and their own arguments about what needs to be changed or whether democracy should be blown up altogether. We believe it's critical to understand not just who these groups are and their motivations, but their goals and what they're doing to reach them. Leading up to the 2016 election, the national media didn't pay a lot of attention to the on the ground organizing. Um, we all learned the hard way that some of the truisms are not true, like that Washington DC has a gravitational pull towards the center. Today, as we gear up for the election in 35 days, we're gonna talk about some of the groups and organizations we've been writing about. Andy, Josh, and AC have been reporting on Ziklag, Project 2025, Accelerationists and the neo Nazis on Telegram and the American Patriots 3%. I'm going to dive right into questions. Andy, can you give us an initial primer on the two organizations that you've been investigating, Ziklag and Project 2025? What are their visions? Where do they overlap and how are they different? Thanks, Tracy. That's great to be here. Great to be here with amazing colleagues and uh, an incredible turnout of people. So really thankful for that. It, it's useful when you think about the groups like Ziklag and Project 2025 to think back to 2016 election that you mentioned just a little sec a second ago here. And to remember that at the time, Donald Trump was this insurgent candidate, an outsider, someone running against the establishment of the Republican Party someone who succeeded, I think, in large part because he cultivated this kind of, again, outsider persona, taking on uh, the big entrenched party interests, you know, in some cases openly ridiculing uh, fellow Republicans running for president. There wasn't a lot of uh, machinery behind him. It was kind of a one man show. This time around, it's very different. The Republican Party is to a large extent um, encircling him. It is, you know, in some ways, a party of one, if you look at the way the party has rallied behind him. And then what you have seen in those years since 2016 is a really, you know, sort of massive buildup, a mobilization of these outside groups, groups that represent different constituencies, get money from different places, have different agendas. But what they have in common is a support for this, uh, again, kind of make America great again, America first vision that Donald Trump more than any other politician represents. And so in Ziklag, uh, a group that we really sort of broke the first story about here at ProPublica, this is a group that brings together ultra wealthy uh, Christian donors. The goal is to try to bring about, or as they say, take dominion over every major aspect of American life. It really is this, uh, you know, all encompassing Christian vision for the future of America. But also in 2024, as we reported, Ziklag has a very intense political plan to try to get Donald Trump elected again, seeing him as the vessel for this Christian dominionist or nationalist vision for the future. Project 2025, now a group that probably most people here have heard of, um, had taken a different approach, which is trying to build a bench of people, a stable of policies, and really a you know, day one, 100 day plan, one year plan for if Donald Trump wins in November so that when he becomes if he becomes president uh, on January 20th, 2025, he will have people ready to hire. He will have policies ready to put in place, executive orders waiting for him, a whole playbook and a blueprint to bring about this very conservative, very, again, America first styled agenda, both in the policies and in the kinds of people that he tries to put in his government. So, Josh, how does, we're going to now move outside of that structure, how does the AP3 and the militia movement 
resonate or diverge with these projects that are being described by Andy? How do they fit into that? Yeah, I mean, so in terms of animating issues, there's actually a lot of overlap between militias like AP3 and something like Project 2025. You know, these militias are uh, very upset about so-called election fraud. Um, you know, what they see as anti-white racism, LGBT content, uh, gun control. Um, and so there's a, um, you know, there is less daylight between the armed extremists and the main currents of Republican politics than you had until really re very recently. And I think that tells us a lot about how the militia movements changed, uh, especially since Trump came into power, where these groups aren't anti-government in quite the way they were in the 90s. They've really oriented themselves for Trump and for MAGA politics. Um, where there's a massive difference between the Heritage Foundation and the militias is how they want to try to achieve their vision. Um, and so for AP3 so far, it has been armed vigilante operations where they go down to the border and round up migrants in unsanctioned patrols or assault Black Lives Matter protesters. Uh, in the midterms, uh, they you know, stood watch at ballot boxes to try to crack down on people casting absentee ballots. Um, and in the last few years, they've been having this very intense debate on you know, when to escalate, if and when they should commit mass political violence, uh, which so far has not transpired, but it, it kind of reached a, a pitch of intensity to the point where you know, some longtime members quit because they were they were scared by the number of people advocating for these acts of terror. So AC, you've been writing about a group recently called Accelerationists. Um, first, can you tell us a little bit about what the group is and what that movement is and how it differs or AP3? First, I got to say, I love that you described this as a fun panel, Tracy. Uh, I would say intense panel. Um, but the accelerations are different than the militia groups and sort of other far right activist groups because their thing is like burn it all down, burn down democracy. There is no political solution. And we can only get to the goal that we want, which is a white ethno state run by a fascist regime through acts of spectacular violence mass violence, industrial sabotage, et cetera. These are people who are typically neo-Nazi white supremacists who have gone as far as you can go in that milieu. And they're at the point where they say, we're organizing online. We're trying to inspire these sort of acts that are outside of the political system that are aimed at bringing down the political system. And obviously th these are small, this is small movement they don't have the capacity to do that, but they do have the capacity to kill people, which is what they have been doing. Oh, okay, it's not fun. I'm, I take it back. Um, so Andy, I, I'm moving on to like how these groups are growing, if they're growing, how are they recruiting? What does that look like? Take us into what recruitment looks like for Ziklag and for Project 2025. and. And, and what you found. There are really two different approaches that make a lot of sense when you think about the strategies, near term and long term, that these two different outfits uh, have put in place and that they're they're mobilizing behind. So if you look at Ziklag, uh, again, this group that really wasn't on a lot of people's radar until we published our story, this is a theory of changing the country that isn't about mass mobilization. It isn't about reaching millions of people, whether they're voters or activists. Um, and, you know, in, 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 a, in a way, as we quote an expert in our story saying, you know, it's not a sort of small D democratic theory of changing America. It's actually about identifying a very, very small select group of people and working in a way to get them into these really senior influential places in Hollywood or Wall Street or education or government, you know, these, these spheres, or as they call them, the seven mountains, um, and then having the change trickle down from there. So recruitment for them is very targeted. Who can we find who maybe works at a Hollywood studio, but shares our vision? Maybe that's an unrealistic thing, but you'd be surprised. 
And how do we get them in? How do we get them bought in to the Ziklag vision? Now, Project 2025, as we reported, we reported on these videos, um, you know, more than two dozen hours of, of, of training videos that Project 2025 put out. I did watch all of them. Um, they were very fun to keep the theme of fun going. Um, but what they're trying to do is identify thousands or tens of thousands of people who want to work in a future conservative administration. That would obviously mean a future Trump administration. Bring them in, vet them, and then train them in this Project 2025, you know, America First model of government. And so, you know, we, you, you, we've heard a lot about what that means in, in terms of the policies of Project 2025. But, you know, it's really crucial because there is this plan in Project 2025 to reclassify and potentially fire thousands or tens of thousands of nonpartisan career government employees and replace them with political appointees. It's a really striking plan. It obviously would kind of take us back 150 years in time to the spoils system. And, you know, we don't really want our air traffic controllers uh, being political appointees who are good, be are there because they're loyal. We want them to be experts who are competent. So the recruitment piece of Project 2025 is actually more about bringing in a lot of people, getting them to match that vision, to buy in to that dramatic change. Uh, and then kind of training them up and having them ready so that if Donald Trump wins, again, these are people who can be vetted and hired, you know, basically as soon as he wins, if he wins in November. Um, Josh, what about militias like AP3? Are these, are they growing and, um, you know, how are they doing recruitment? Yeah, I mean, so there's been a, a real sea change there in the last few years. So. Right after January 6, militias were in a state of crisis. Um, it's, I, mean, I think it's easy to forget now just how intense the backlash to the Capitol riot was, even in MAGA circles. Um, for groups like AP3, they were, they were hemorrhaging members. Uh, people were quitting because they were afraid they'd get fired. Uh, people were losing friends over their militia ties. Um, and in the senior leadership of this Ma this very large national militia, people were saying, we might not be able to survive this. Uh, the militia movement as a whole might not be able to recover. Uh, but then within about a year or so, things really started to turn around. And there were kind of two key factors there. One was that Facebook started loosening its controls on paramilitary organizing. And so rather than having to try to reach people at say, you know, setting up a booth at a gun show, you could much more efficiently find people online and then use Facebook to get them away from their computer and participating in the militia in the real world. And then the other thing was this change in the political climate where, you know, it didn't happen immediately, but about six months or so after January 6th, you start having Trump and other major Republican politicians um, starting to embrace the January 6 defendants as as patriots as political prisoners and for a you know a certain swath of society it started to feel okay to participate in these groups again and in AP3 you started having people joining all of a sudden saying January 6 inspired me to join um, and so you know, they were able to expand at a dramatic pace we have you know as many as 50 people coming in each day and uh, it got to the point where leaders of the group were struggling to keep up with that influx. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And AC, you've been looking on Telegram, what role Telegram plays in in the sort of spread of both ideas and this and the recruitment of people in both accelerationists and other groups. What are you seeing there? Yeah, and I should say, you know, in the modern American neo-Nazi and white supremacist movement, there's always been kind of two threads. And one was like, engage in the political process. The other one was to engage in acts of terrorism, guerrilla warfare, and so forth. The people we're focused on are in that sort of second tier. A few years ago, they were meeting in person. They were forming um, in real life groups and going out and doing things. The FBI got involved, took down a lot of these people. And by 2020, it started changing. What you saw was they were moving to a model that was almost entirely decentralized, where they were meeting in channels and chats on Telegram. And rather than forming 
new in real life groups, you had influencers on these platforms encouraging others to go out and engage in acts of terrorism or sabotage sort of individually on their own. And I think that's made it in some ways uh, easier to recruit. Telegram has been this incredible thing where it brought basically the Silk Road, the dark web to the open web. And people were able to say really crazy things, do really crazy things and say, hey, you know, I think you should go engage in terrorism. Here's a manual for building bombs. And that gave uh, people in this scene a sort of tool that they'd never had before. As wild as like, Twitter could be at times or or other mainstream platforms. You just couldn't go on there and say like, hey, go kill people with a bomb. Here's the recipe for it. You just did, it didn't happen. And Telegram has been this very unique and very potent tool for recruitment, organizing, and propagandizing around terrorism. I, I want to read a quote, AC, from your story. Um, e regarding crackdowns on Telegram, in your piece, you quote an FBI agent who has you know, conducted some of these infiltration operations with white supremacists. And the quote is, every time we have a success against one of them, they learn, they adapt, they modify. Extremists can simply pick up and move to a new platform once they are deplatformed for content abuses. This leaves law enforcement and intelligence agencies playing an endless game of whack-a-mole to identify where the next threat may be coming from. Josh, you say that AP3 has also become less consolidated, more dispersed into several discrete militias. For the both of you, how do, you, how do your reporting strategies change when these groups and the places they gather and where they are next is so ephem ephemeral, like where... How do you do your reporting on these groups and how do you follow them where they, they turn to next? You know, for me, I think one of the fascinating things is to, to see that evolution and to watch groups move from platform to platform to platform and also to see how they bounce from mainstream platforms where they'll go and say things for which they won't be banned, but then try to drive uh, interest to alternative loosely moderated platforms like Telegram or Odyssey or Gab, and then hook followers there and then push them into even more private chats or more discrete spaces. So watching that to me is fascinating, but it just means that compared to a few years ago, you have to go through more steps to find where the action is. Yeah, and just to add briefly to that, I mean, I think militias have uh, one big lesson they took from January 6 is they got smarter about kind of operational security. And so a lot of this planning is happening is it, less planning is happening less in the open. It's, you know, you can't turn on Facebook and look at the right places and kind of understand the, the current pulse of the militia movement. Um, so from a reporting perspective, you have to talk to more people, get access to Kind of restricted private chats, um, but I think that like the kind of most interesting consequence of that, most important consequence is that uh, as these groups, you know, as you said, are also getting more fractured, and there's just more small militias uh, cropping up and dominating the movement. Uh, it could be a lot harder for law enforcement to track what's going on and to you know, intervene before one of these groups can uh, go out and do something violent. Mm -hmm. Andy, we were talking earlier about um, Project 2025 and sort of its plan and how it was something that was quite different than, you know, previous, you know, pre-election plans. And it's gotten a lot of attention and criticism as things have come out about what's in the plan, what are the objectives of the plan from the Harris campaign and from others. Has this attention, has all of the publicity that it's gained from people talking a little bit about more what it is like in your stories, has that impacted its momentum? And what is there parts of it that you think haven't got enough attention? I've covered uh, campaigns and politics now for like 15 years. And, you know, I think I counted myself in the somewhat cynical crowd that, uh, you know, policy doesn't really matter anymore in politics and that it's all about messages or social media use it's about personalities and and you know these viral moments now no one cares about policy and yet here we are 
uh, for most of this year, we've been talking about having a debate about this 889 page blueprint that is the Project 2025 blueprint. And yes, if you're wondering, I have also read that. Um, it took me a little while, but I did. Um, so I, yeah, I didn't think that we would we would end up in this position, but I'm heartened in some way that we are. And yes, pro this this blueprint of Project 2025s, and you know, basically that's just the shorthand Project 2025 has become not just a a topic of discussion, but actually a pretty significant weight on top of Donald Trump's presidential candidacy. He, going back to 2022, uh, was extremely um, pleased with the work of the Heritage Foundation. He flew uh, on a private plane with the president of Heritage to an event in Florida where he sang the praises of Heritage, love these guys, love what they're doing. Heritage comes out with this Project 2025 wow. effort and... It's really unpopular, and, and honestly, now the Trump campaign can't get far enough away from Project 2025, insists uh, at every chance it gets that it has nothing to do with the Trump campaign, that you know they don't like what they're doing, that you know there's no connections, even though the reporting shows, including our own reporting, that most of the product, most of the substance in either the policy blueprint or the training videos that we wrote about you know, is coming from former Trump administration or Trump campaign officials. So to say that there's no connection, formally, there may be no connection, but in terms of the actual substance of it, there, there are many connections. If you dig into the policies, there are a lot of them that are really unpopular. And, and you know, it's not entirely shocking, given what, you know, we know about public sentiment these days. I mean, there are there's language in Project 2025 talking about what the American family should look like, a man, a woman, children. It's a sort of very 1950s um, vision for the American nuclear family. And obviously, that's not what um, a lot of American families look like today. It's not surprising. That's an unpopular stance. The most unpopular stances or, or positions that we've seen, and this has been pulled, one is this notion of replacing career nonpartisan employees with political loyalists that, you know, you get 60 some percent of people in a UMass Amherst poll saying they don't want that. Shutting down the Department of Education entirely. That is both in Project 2025 and in Agenda 47, which is the Trump campaign's official policy plan. So that also does not poll very well at all. I think, um, again, in the 60s, which is hard to get on almost anything these days. And there are also a number of plans in Project 2025 to reduce access to contraception, to restrict reproductive rights, and those fall even worse. So it's not surprising that this Project 2025 agenda has become, again, a kind of an albatross for Donald Trump. And, you know, it's become one of the most, uh, one of the biggest liabilities for him. And I think that's why you hear you know, the, the vice president talk about it as much as she does and probably will be, you know, all the way through Election Day. Yeah. Um, you know, I, let's, let's shift a little bit to the actual election. There's been a lot of concern that there'll be a repeat of January 6th, that we're, there's a lot of concern. What is what is the expectation there? Former national security officials say it's the most urgent question regarding the militias that that we've been writing about will january 6 prove a high watermark or are we on the verge or prelude to something more catastrophic and i'd like to address that to both josh and ac you've been monitoring it what are your thoughts um i mean i think i don't have the answer to that question i think it's incredibly important to know though that we, we it's it's too early to tell it's still you know while we've had three years since january 6 it's still too early to tell if that will be kind of the final hurrah of the post obama militia movement um and you know these groups in many ways have gotten more volatile more radical people that are still engaged in this and they look back at January 6 and talk about it as a as a as a botched job that they're you know 
didn't have the plans were poorly executed and didn't go far enough. Um, and so um, whether or not that will come, you know, whether or not the a worse version of January 6th comes to fruition is going to depend on a bunch of, you know, things that are impossible to predict. But, uh, you know, I think it's easy to forget how close we were to something much worse that day. That you know, what would have happened if these if if the mob had gotten a hundred feet further and caught Mike Pence? Um, that's something people in these groups are thinking about too. Uh, except in their case, they would have liked to have been a more violent day. Um, and they, uh, you know, have talked to people who are you know hoping they'll get another shot at this. I have a I have a good note and a bad note and i'll start with the good note um and I, i'd love you know josh you might have a thought on this uh it's fascinating to me that what you see on alternative social media is the chatter is really angry really aggressive when there was the first assassination attempt on former president trump there was so much chatter about civil war deep state um very violent chatter uh that's big. There's a lot of insurrectionary and violent talk, uh, particularly on alternative social media. However, I reported extensively on extremist groups in the run up to the 2020 election, the aftermath. And when I would go out at that time, to, there were rallies constantly. There were very violent rallies. When I would go to events, it was very regular that someone would be beaten or stabbed or even shot. And we're just not seeing that. There is not action in the streets. And when I talk to people who monitor these movements, they're kind of baffled. They're like, hey, there's so much conversation online, but it's not translating into the real world. So there's a possibility that we may see nothing. And that would be, wow, that would be tremendous for democracy. Um, yeah. You know, I would say my bad note, my scary note goes like this. January 6th was... And what we kind of saw in the, the run-up and aftermath of the, the last presidential election, I would say it's kind of an aberration because you had kind of mass extremist violence. And the American model, much more so, is smaller groups, individuals doing Tim McVeigh kind of stuff. And I still am very much worried that you may see that kind of action that somebody in a group that I follow or a group that Josh follows or another group that's not even on our radar right now could engage in a spectacular act of violence without a lot of trouble. You know, it doesn't take that much work to do something awful in America. We have very easy access to what, you know, high power weapons. So that remains an abiding concern for me. Uh, Andy, I was curious, um, you've reported on the ground in Michigan and other places uh, about um, what's going on, on on the grassroots, but what, how do you think the groups that we're talking about, but also other reporting you've done this year, what what how are people prepping for a contested call or a close call, or what do you think will happen if we have one that is very close or contested? To take a cue from AC, I feel like there is good news and there's bad news on that front, and I'll start with the bad news and then go to the good news. The bad news is that the the sort of conversation and the organizing and the sort of spiraling speculation uh, that has happened around election denial never really stopped after 2020. There was never a point in June of 2021 where they all said, OK, well, he's not going to be president. It's going to be Biden. Let's move on. You're like that, it, it, if anything, actually, those kind of amorphous beliefs started coalescing and actually leading to mobilization. You know, we published some great work before I even got here in 2022 about the Steve Bannon and the precinct strategy. This very, very grassroots effort to bring people in and organize in, within the Republican Party, and that was very much fueled by these beliefs that. The election was stolen in 2020. The people I spent time with in Michigan, you know, they not only believe that the 
2020 election was fraudulent. They believed that the 2022 midterms were fraudulent. They believed that there were primaries, that there were even intra-party, you know, kind of caucus leadership results that were suspect. So this this energy continues to be there. It hasn't gone away. And if anything, it's had four years to to sort of percolate or marinate or whatever term you want to use. So I think if there if we are in a contested election situation, even a very close election situation, you're going to see the, the same kind of the same group of people, especially in battleground states, uh, coming out of the woodwork again and and having had, I guess, three or four years of time to to think about what they might do or or you know offices that they might target, things like that. The good news, I would say, is that in a lot of states, nonpartisan election officials and elected you know, partisan elected officials like secretaries of state have done a lot of work to try to shore up their systems and to try to prepare similarly for a very tight and or contested election. You've seen a lot of work done in Michigan, my beloved home state, uh, by the secretary of state and the legislature there to just take those uncertainties out to clear up legal ambiguities. Congress even did this with the Electoral Count Reform Act. They took some of the uncertainty and ambiguity out of this very old provision that kind of created some of the chaos in Congress around January 6th, took some of the, the again, the, the uncertainty out of that and tried to shore that up. So I think that the guardrails are are stronger. There are more of them. There has been a lot of preparation by the people who tirelessly work to make sure the election is fair and secure, um, no matter who wins. But again, these two things are going to collide in the event of a contested election. And, you know, we're not obviously sitting here with our crystal ball able to predict exactly how that would play out. Did you get a sense from covering Ziklag that they are prepping for such a, a contested election? Yeah, yeah. You get a sense of, I mean, obviously the the election fraud, election denial ideology, you could call it, is woven into their larger worldview. And you know, there was a lot of discussion about you know fraudulent votes and electoral fraud, electoral, you know, fraud, voter fraud in the videos that we obtained from Ziklag. You know, what what's also so striking and a little chilling, honestly, is, you know, the 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 way folks like Ziklag and and allied groups in that, again, sort of that more Christian nationalist uh, wing of conservatism talk about this election is that it's more than just an election. It is spiritual warfare is a term they use a lot. And there is an almost apocalyptic rhetoric that, you know, this is our moment to save the country. If we don't save the country, it is on the brink of collapse or collapse is assured if Kamala Harris wins. And, and Lance Wall now, someone in that story, someone whom vice presidential nominee J.D. Vance appeared with this past weekend, you know, he is a big sort of propagator of this, again, kind of apocalyptic, like it's now or never message and you know that that has an effect in in the different audiences that hear that you know they think you know maybe they think to they can justify more extreme actions if they th actually think the country you know will cease to exist if the election doesn't go the right way so the temperature is turned up very high right now uh, josh i know that when you were working on your story we we had a discussion once about like, what is the signal to go? What is the signal to act for AP3? Do you feel like the election, like there, if some particular thing were to happen, that would be it? I mean, it's certainly something they're talking about as, um, it's something that's on the table for them. Uh, much like the people Andy was reporting on, you know, they see this as, a, a last chance to save the country from doom and you know they're talking about their leaders talking about you know how they're prepared to violently force their way into voting centers if or whatever it takes and i think as one put it uh 
he predicted that this uh, election won't be decided at the ballot box, it'll be decided through the ammo box. Um, but in terms of will there actually be, you know, like what specific triggers are there to look out for? I mean, I think, you know, something that a lot of the experts and national security officials I've talked to are worried about is, you know, if Trump again loses and refuses to accept the results and that prompts this sort of protest movement, um, just like AC was talking about, you know, recent history suggests that that's something that these extremist groups really latch onto and use to widen their ranks and bring people into this sort of uh, more uh, violent ready uh, activity. Um, and so I think you know, that is a, a huge potential trigger um, and you know, I, I'm, I am remembering the crowds outside of, you know, counting centers in 2020 where they're, you know, shouting, stop the count uh, in Detroit. Hey, and, you know, I, I don't want to be fear mongering here, but I do, I do worry about, you know, the people who have spent the next, last four years thinking, oh, if I, only I'd done something, or if only I'd done something more extreme that actually would have made this stop. Um, and then... But there's a whole lot of things that you know experts are, are uh, looking at here that might be you know less obvious. I mean, one is if Trump wins and then follows through on his promise to pardon January 6th defendants. Um, I mean, that would be a really you know a show of solidarity with violent extremism that has no precedent in recent memory, um, and I there is a possibility that the kind of most extreme wing of the party will see that as some sort of uh, get out of jail free card for doing violence for the cause and that that could spark um, a new wave of violence in the next four years. But how does this sort of reporting that you're doing now and the sort of reporting some of our colleagues at other places have done that brings a lot more awareness and puts a lens on a lot of groups that we didn't know much about what role does that have in in our sort of ability? You know, that awareness does that does that put some bumpers around what these groups can accomplish? Um, I think it has an impact. I mean, AP three has had a really tough go of it since our story came out. I mean, these groups work really hard to operate in secret. Um, they work really hard when they, especially since January 6th, when they do something like uh, cause a national controversy by sending our men to intimidate voters at ballot boxes, they don't want that traced back to them. They want everyone to think uh, that those people were lone wolves uh, acting on their own. Um, and so you're exposing these kind of central hubs, exposing how they're talking, how they're thinking, um, you know, is something that I hope helps the authorities better prepare, better understand kind of the threat that they're up against. And it definitely, um, you know, these groups, you know, these people, the, 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 the militia movement, I think, is larger than the neo-Nazis that are ready to blow up a, a power station, but they're also more cowardly or not that's not the right word uh they're they less uh you, they, they don't want to go to jail that might be um, the right word yes <laughs> <laughs> and so you know th this um if they are facing backlash it has a real impact on kind of their ability to grow and uh bring in the sort of numbers that they want mm -hmm. but but ac what do you think you know, one thing that's fascinating to me is, you know, going back to 2016, 2017, when I'm reporting on this beat, is people didn't know anything about these movements. They didn't know who these people were. They didn't know what was going on. And I think in the years since, there's just become this incredible public uh, civil society literacy around extremism. And that, I think, is a great thing and a really important thing. I think you see uh, average people in communities being very aware of the perils that some of these groups and ideas pose. I think you see a much more um, awareness on the part of journalists about how to cover these groups and, and are covering these groups. And I think on the terms of law enforcement, I remember talking to folks in law enforcement years ago as this first started ramping up and they, 
I felt like they were behind. They were like 15 years behind. And they were talking to me about stuff that was relevant in the 80s and 90s. And this is like 2016, 2017. And I was like, it's a different game. These are different movements. They're inspired by the 80s and 90s, but they're utilizing Web 2.0 modern technology to do something different. And now I would say, I think when you look at law enforcement, they are absolutely read into the threat, absolutely capable of confronting it. You know, so I think it, all of that is different. And you now we, we're on a big spectrum here of different kinds of ideas and movements and groups. But Andy, I, I was curious whether you thought you're reporting on, on Ziklag and they're talking about the voter rolls and suppression and such. Do you think having that as a as like now out in the open has has an impact on what the group does? Oh, without a doubt. From our reporting and, and just from even the very modest online footprint that the group had. Yeah, it's I think it's it's definitely had an impact. And you know, I see the group talked about online and in in real life. You know, people ask me about it and you know in ways that I didn't think would happen. Um, you know, I, I think it also tapped into feeling that I sense a lot of people have, which is this sort of, you know, increasing uh, sort of relationship between Republican politics and this world, again, of of Christian nationalism or, or Christian dominionism. And this group sort of shows that in stark terms. And I think that that has just sort of opened a lot of people's eyes and also has brought some scrutiny to the group, which, as our reporting showed, some of this group's uh, activities did do, do merit some scrutiny in terms of the tax code and what you can and can't do as a C3 charity. So, yeah. All right. So uh, this has been terrific, but we want to leave some time for the question and answer uh, portion of our proceeding here. We all have about 15 minutes for it. Um, and before we get to that, uh, my colleagues are going to be posting a survey in the chat box. And we'd appreciate you taking taking it and um, because your feedback will really be helpful to informing the content of our future events. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and you can submit that to us. So I am going with some questions that were earlier submitted um, by you. Um, Andy, what differentiates Christian nationalism from evangelical Christianity? Good question. Something that I myself didn't totally understand when we started reporting and writing our story about Ziklag. So if you think of evangelical Christianity and especially the way it manifests in American politics, you know, we think about Pat Robertson, we think about Jerry Falwell, and we think about the moral majority. What those religious leaders were trying to do was to mobilize, to awaken and mobilize what they believed was a huge swath of the American population or electorate that wasn't involved in politics, that wasn't active in the civic space, and to convince those people that if they wanted to change the direction of their country and they wanted to see elected officials who better represented their beliefs and their values, including their you know religious beliefs and values, that they needed to be more active at the ballot box and they needed to mobilize and harness their power and get out there and, and elect people who better represented them. And that was kind of the model for a while, but that's not really the same thing as what Ziklag in the big picture is trying to do. I mean, as I said earlier, Ziklag is not a small D democratic play to reach tens of millions of people to awaken a, a sleeping giant or a silent majority. In the long term, Ziklag wants again to find these uh, handful of elites to you know, bring them in under the tent to um, cultivate them, to get them meeting other fellow you know conservative Christian leaders, and then to have them go out and again try to get into positions of influence in American life and then enact changes from there to, again, to use Ziklag's metaphor, this notion of the seven uh, mountain mandate to get these people to the top of the mountain. And then from there 
to try to move, you know, the country in a much more uh, conservative Christian direction. And that is not about mobilizing huge numbers of people. And it's not really necessarily a small D democratic theory of change, if you will, to use a wonky term. It's much more about kind of working um, behind the scenes and getting people into C-suites, getting people into these positions where they can then dictate the agenda, they can dictate the values and the beliefs. And, and that's a really key difference between evangelical Christian politics or strategy and, and what this group is now trying to do. That's a good explanation. Um, okay, this is a question. We're lucky to have Josh here because this question dovetails with another project he did on the Supreme Court and, and the ethics scandal on the Supreme Court. Is there a possibility of the United States Supreme Court judges exposed by ProPublica's reporting being held to account officially in the long run? Has there been a precedent in history and in what scenario can that occur? The great question. Um, so in terms of specific measures of accountability for say Clarence Thomas and the conduct that we reported on last year, um, there's kind of two main options, theoretically. Um, I say theoretically because I don't think either of these will happen, um, but there could be impeachment. Um, one justice has been impeached in our country's history. It was in um, 1805, I believe. Uh, and I think that is essentially an impossibility in this case. Um, and then the other is there's actually a, some kind of investigation or inquiry going on right now within the judiciary uh, for Thomas allegations that Thomas violated really the one rule, one law that justices have to follow when it comes to ethics, which is when they receive gifts, they have to tell the public about it. You know, as we reported, Thomas took an enormous number of undisclosed gifts over the year that many, many legal experts say he was required by law to disclose. And um, if this you know, kind of secretive judicial body finds that there's even reasonable cause to believe he might have willfully failed to disclose these things, they're supposed to refer that to the attorney general for investigation and potential civil or criminal penalties. Um, so that, that's been going on for a year and a half at this point. We still have no window into where, where that stands. Um, I think... Um, the possibility of that referral happening is exceedingly unlikely in part because the, the this judicial body has never done that before. They tend to like to handle things in house. Um, but I'm, I'm glad this person uh, said in the long term, I think there's a lot more movement in the long term for changing how ethics is approached at the Supreme Court. Um, you know, last year, the justices adopted a code of conduct for the first time in the nation's history, uh, which has a lot of problems with it. There is no enforcement mechanism, but already, even at the court itself, we're starting to see more of a push towards creating a enforceable system of ethics, which the Supreme Court has never had before. And, you know, currently stands alone is really essentially the only part of the federal government without that. Um, and so, you know, I think we're seeing a sea change in how the justices are talking about this publicly, how they're thinking about it. Um, I don't think anything's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, but and then within Congress, there's been a lot of energy, uh, particularly among Democrats, of passing aggressive legislation to uh, kind of bring the Supreme Court in line with the rest of the government, uh, which has been, you know, kind of a non-starter uh, the last year or so in a divided Congress. But um, I, I think this is going to be a conversation that's going to be continuing to play out um, whatever happens uh, in November. Um, this is a good question for AC. I have watched AC um, cover um, the extremism and um, get inside communities to tell us all what what's happening in them, what their motivations are, how they're operating. Um, this question is for someone just beginning their coverage of these groups, where mm -hmm. should we start? And given the coverage you've been doing this year, what would you advise? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, 
like I've said, I, I feel like the native habitat for these groups and these movements is online and that they have their own ecosystem of conversations that are going on on various platforms that are typically not Twitter, typically not Facebook. And I think the more time you can spend in those spaces, whether it's True Social or Patriots.Win or um, BitChute, or Odyssey, or a lot on Telegram, I think the more that you understand. Uh, and then I think you move from there into being into more private, um, secure chats and conversations. But I really do feel like a lot of the people I look at, that is that is sort of where they live. They spend way too much time online. And to understand them, you kind of have to spend way too much time online. Um, okay, this is a long-winded question for Andy. What sources can we point to that establish the facts of election security that could help quiet skeptics' doubts? They seem unsatisfied with journalists and agencies simply saying it's safe because they have a vested interest in, quote, the establishment winning, as they say, and instead want the mechanisms and why we know it's safe. Yes, I have some some very easily um, accessible and shareable resources for anyone who is trying to, you know, convince their uncle at Thanksgiving about election security or, or even before then, hopefully. So one website that I would direct everyone to is called lostnotstolen.org. And again, that is lostnotstolen.org. What is, what is this site? It is a very readable report by an esteemed, very accomplished group of conservatives, conservative lawyers who reviewed every single legal claim that Donald Trump's campaign made around the, yes, thank you, Jill, made around the 2020 election and scrutinized it, you know, forensically, without bias, without any partisan skew, and explain explains why that claim was not true or did not succeed in court. I haven't seen anything as comprehensive, but also accessible as lostnotstolen.org. And it's the thing that I use all the time, even when I'm on a reporting trip. When I was in uh, Michigan, you know, I was meeting with someone, a guy who's in the story, and I sent lostnotstolen.org to him. And I think he found some interesting stuff in it. I don't know if I totally convinced him, but he found that was interesting. So there's that. I would also say that, you know, depending on what state you live in, you should try to become a little more acquainted with your secretary of state website, because, you know, since 2020, the secretaries of state have become a lot more vocal in trying to combat bad information, rumors, viral memes, whatever it is that might shake people's faith, shake people's faith in the election. And, and that is a new thing. Secretaries of state, I don't think, really saw their role as that outward facing or that public facing in the past. They have become much more so Democrats and Republicans since 2020. So I would also urge people to check out your Secretary of State's website. A lot of them have like an FAQ or a fact-checking page where they will go one by one through the kinds of stuff you might be seeing on Facebook or hearing on TV or hearing from your, your pals or whatever. Obviously, I would recommend following us and following our coverage. So, you know, we're taking a bite out of all of this stuff as well and covering the election from, you know, the perspective of democracy, not, you know, with a partisan angle at all, but but what is good for democracy and what people are saying and the threats that it's facing and, and whether those things are real or not and why. I think between those, you've got a lot of resources. You've got a lot of tools at your disposal to kind of sift through some of the uh, less reputable stuff to to get real information about what's going on. So this question sort of pairs with that a bit. It's from a lawyer who says, as lawyers unfamiliar with election law, what are the most important volunteer roles we should take on to protect the vote in the 2024 election? And what can voters do? It all seems so overwhelming. I'll take that very quickly. Um, if you go to the uh, Election Assistance Commission's website, the EAC, or if you just Google EAC poll worker, 
you will find a site. And on that site, you scroll down a little bit, there's a very handy interactive sign-up tool where you basically say where you live and it will spit out for you how to, in a very easy way, sign up to be a poll worker. No matter what state that I've reported in, every election official I've talked to could always use more poll workers, people who care about just ensuring the election goes off successfully. They are always short on volunteers. They haven't quite recovered from the 2020 pandemic era election. You know, if a lawyer came to them and said, I want to be a poll worker, I think they would be over the moon to have uh, you volunteer for that role. And it's also a great crash course in how elections work. You'll see exactly why things work the way they do and all the different safeguards uh, built into how elections are and, and, and why a lot of the stuff you'll see online is bogus because you're actually there seeing it happen and helping work it. So yeah, EAC poll worker, be a great place to, to volunteer. And, um, and you'll also learn some stuff as well, which um, is, is great. Um, I think we are almost at our conclusion here. Um, I wanted to um, thank everyone for coming. Uh, we uh, really appreciated all your questions. We really enjoyed sharing with you about our, our stories. Um, we want to thank the reporters for answering all the questions and um, Again, this, this event has been recorded, and so you'll receive an email afterwards with a full video of today's discussion. Our link to our event survey will also be added to the chat box. We appreciate your feedback again. And from all of us at ProPublica, thank you for joining us, and have a great evening. We look forward to seeing you next time, and we certainly would love to hear other events you'd like to see from us. Um, and I appreciate it. Thank you.